round and round we go, we hold each other's hands. Round and round we go, we hold each other's hands. Weave our lives in a circle, our love is strong and the dance goes on. Our love is strong and the dance goes on. Nice to see a few of you joining. Round and round we go, we hold each other's hands. Round and round we go, we hold each other's hands. Weave our lives in a circle. Our love is strong and the dance goes on. Our love is strong and the dance goes on once more. Join in. Round and round we go, we hold each other's hands. Round and round we go, we hold each other's hands. Weave our lives in a circle. Our love is strong and the dance goes on. <coughs> our love is strong and the dance goes on. Our love is strong and the dance goes on. It's caught my breath there. <laughs> on the word. <clears throat> So welcome to Sovereign Earth. Just a couple of minutes late because when I went to press the button, play live, it came up, broadcast failed. So I had to set it, re turn off and start again. So I'm a couple of minutes late. Um, hope, hope that didn't bother too many of you too much. That wasn't especially funny, although I was surprisingly calm about it compared to how it could be. Anyway, this is uh, Sovereign Earth, and it's already um, broadcast number 58. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got something caught in my throat. Um, and humour is the topic. Ha ha ha. <laughs> so, Sovereign Earth is all about, from a vision of for humanity to hold nature as being sacred again. And so, 58 different topics ranging uh, from ranging right across the spectrum from humility to joy, from death to uh, pilgrimage, and many, many more. You, anyone following them will know. But humour is essential. Humour is essential. It's one of the key virtues that I happen to call in in my practice. Um, although I'm not always brilliant at exposing, uh, expounding, <laughs> expounding that. Um, it's an art. Some have it more than others, or some have worked more on it than others. But why it's so important, especially within my path of Druidry, we talk about, I talk about reverence and mirth. Reverence and mirth. So what is that about? Uh, it's kind of like prayerfulness and playfulness, but the mirth is the humour. And in ceremonies, when I conduct um, naming ceremonies or marriage ceremonies or death ceremonies, um, hatchings, matchings and dispatchings as I call them, then <coughs> what's essential within the sacredness and the profundity of the moment, there's always space for humour. It's like that dot in the yin-yang yin -yang symbol. All reverence with it and no mirth is quite sterile. And all play with no reverence is also quite I don't know, boring ultimately, they, they, they infuse each other. So mirth, humour, let's have an explore. I'm not an expert in any of these subjects I talk about, but the, the idea always is to drop seeds, to plant some seeds or to drop, as I prefer to call it, pull, pebbles in the pond. Pebbles in the pond of unknowing, so humour. It's better to laugh about your problems than to cry about them. That's a Jewish proverb. Better to laugh about your problems than to cry about them. <clears throat> a lot of truth in that. So there's a vast range of humour. We'll explore it. Um, we'll be going through different types of humour. 
three different types as I see it and Eastern humour, Greek humour, just touching on them to, to illustrate what, what humour might be. And then we'll be, we're going to laughter as well. Some of the tragedy of laughter and some of the joy throughout this, the joy and the healing. <clears throat> Francis Bacon said, um, Imagination is given to man to compensate him for what he has not. Humour, a sense of humour is given to man to console him for what he is. <laughs> so humour is, is, a, is a gift to keep us keep us uh, alive I was going to say keep us sane but yes it does I think humour does keep us sane in a bizarre and paradoxical way so <clears throat> okay a humorous the bone this bone I think it's this bone is the humorous and there's a funny bone down here we talk of the funny bone it's the ulnar nerve um, going over the condyle they call it of the, of the humorous and when it's struck in a particular way, I, I'm not going <laughs> to, I don't want to achieve that at the moment because it's, it's not altogether funny. But this mention of funny bone only occurs in, in English in the 19, 1830s when it first comes in. But isn't it funny that it's called, isn't it, that's the other thing about the word funny, isn't it strange? Funny, that the bird, this is called the humorous and there's a funny bone. And here we are. Now humour. This is fascinating for me because humour has this hum at the start and I've talked about this in other progr another programme in depth but for me that's a magic syllable, hum, because we're hum, humans, and the earth is hum, humus, hummus, and hum. These are all earth medicines and humour is an earth medicine. Humans are of the earth, hummus is the earth. Hum mm, takes us into our bodies and earths us. Humour is an earthing medicine. Hum. Mm. <laughs> it's a universal language, we know this, but isn't that amazing? We can go anywhere in the world and uh, sit round a fire and share food and laugh at when somebody uh, eats it in a strange way. We have that in common, no matter what. Although there are vast differences in, in, in humour between cultures. I say vast, not over the basics, not over um, common eating, sleeping, um, being, but there are peculiarities, nuances more. It's probably nuances between uh, different culture, different parts of the country. There's, there are different humours in, in, um, across England, subtly. Yorkshire humour is a bit different to Cornish humour and a bit different to... Brummy humour, black country humour. Um, Yalma's daft as a bottle of pop, I remember from my youth. I'm not sure that was meant as humour, that was just a comment on, <laughs> on being. Um, I remember from my youth a couple of things, but uh, one was that I was incredibly ticklish. I, 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 supremely ticklish. My, my dad in particular used to tickle me in front of uh, visitors to... Um, to amuse them, but actually I found it quite painful. And I learned in this, in this uh, researching this, tickling can be used as a form of torture. If it's, it's very, very, <laughs> it's, when taken too far, it's, uh, it's painful. But I was always, I was laughing a lot as a child, I still do, but uh, that's an interesting thing. Children laugh more than adults, generally. I suppose if a kid's brought up in a, a none too pleasant environment, they're not gonna laugh and smile that much although I'll mention something later that's very interesting. Um, so, yeah, children laugh more. Different parts of the country laugh more. They've studied this, and uh, I wish I had the, the, those details to hand. I remember it from years ago. Um, I know one I remember from my childhood. Um, a, frown, a frown, to frown takes something like 73 muscle contractions. A smile only 35 something like that so why waste energy was the <laughs> was the punchline if a frown's taking that many <clears throat> so laughing and humor produ produce these endorphins which are generally for good health 
but humour isn't always applied for good health. But generally, that's how I uh, would like to mainly focus on. We'll touch on other forms of humour, but to bring a good feeling. Um, just earlier this week, I was, I was um, touched by, I was thinking what sort of humorous things are, are in my life at the moment. There's always humour in life. Um, but there was a cartoon with, um, it's a man, if you imagine a man and a dog. So I'm, I'm looking over a settee and the dog's next to me. And we're looking out a window to the garden and the wall and onto the street. And, there, and then and there's someone walking by. And they're both up on the back of the city and the man turns to the dog and say, says, all these years, I've, I've wondered why you spend hours and hours up here looking out the window. And, and of course, with COVID <laughs> and lockdown, here we are doing what dogs do, looking out the window. The other one that came to mind was I, I work one day a week up on the farm and um, uh, Maddie, one of the people who works with me, was describing how she wanted to cheer a partner up. He was getting a little bit fed up with it all, like most of us at some point, I guess. <clears throat> and she, she's devised this crazy dance, which they're, they're learning and they're doing every day and developing it. I've asked to see it in good time, but uh, they're not ready to perform it yet. But I hope after lockdown we'll get to see it. But she said it's really lifted him. It's so funny. It's crazy. There's a degree of stupidity to it. But they laugh a lot and... So simple, it's what children do naturally. And it's what we can lose sight of in these darker times and uh, humour's always around us. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm just, yeah, I was, I was drawn to reflect on what, what programmes, I'll ask the question of you, what programmes can you recall, uh, comedy or humour that really tickle you, that touch you? particularly and have, have really made you laugh a lot you might want to put one or two up <laughs> and I'll tell you some that have touched me so I'm thinking I'm thinking Monty Python that might be <laughs> this, these are all self and age but Monty Python certainly is crazy humor but of my time Faulty Towers John Cleese is, is incredibly funny um, Rowan Atkinson is, is Mr Bean and other things and um, Blackadder um, those sort of, the goodies going back further <laughs> there's another story about the goodies coming up later um, so all, yes it's interesting what, what, what are the what, what programs uh, particularly um, spark us why are they funny what is it we know they're good for us. Okay. So there are studies, the studies have been done, which, I mean, I don't know quite how they did this, but I've read and I, it, it makes sense that um, those of good humour, those who are able to laugh a lot, they can, um, they live on average seven years longer. I'm not sure how on earth they would measure that, but it, it stands to reason that you'd live longer. And also there was a study done in, in 2000 that showed that on, there was they worked out that if those that didn't laugh if you didn't laugh you were 40 percent more likely to die of a heart attack <laughs> so interesting isn't it because laughing it, it relaxes the blood vessels they dilate the blood flows more readily the endorphins flow it's just um good medicine good medicine it says here, George Carlin, humour is a healing art. Humour is a healing art. It's something I think that as children we do it naturally and then we can forget it. It's to be developed. It needs, needs attention like any, anything else. If I meditate more, I, I'm generally more likely to be slightly better at it. If I think about humour in things, I'm more likely to see it. Everything, well, nearly everything have an angle of humour about it. Humour adds colour to a world gone grey with inattention. Humour adds colour to a world gone grey with inattention. So what, how, how apt and appropriate in this time of lockdown and, and in the middle of depths of winter, in the middle of January, 
or towards the end of January now, yeah, how, how we need humour to, to lighten us. And William James, a sense of humour is just common sense dancing. A sense of humour is just common sense dancing. So it's the best antidote for depression, anxiety. It's the best way of making friends and keeping them. Well, one of, maybe not the best, but one of the best ways of making friends and keeping them, to have a sense of humour. It certainly attracts friends. It lightens human burdens. Yeah, the great, however great our burden, humour, the right humour can lighten those burdens. And it's a route towards serenity and contentment. So why wouldn't we consider it? I think especially when it's coupled with wisdom, wisdom with humour, humour with wisdom, but we come into that later. Humour, the sunshine of the mind. Humour, the sunshine of the mind. I, I recall if 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 stress is the villain, if stress is the villain, then humour is the superhero. <laughs> so, here we, I'm going to read you a poem by E. E. Cummings. Now, I don't know. I'm not sure whether he wrote it with the intention of it being particularly humorous, although I think it is. It's got child, a childish quality, which obviously an, is often associated with humour. Humour comes naturally to children. They delight in humour. And what a shame if we lose that ability. E. E. Cummings. May my heart always be open to little birds who are the secret of living. May my heart always be open to little birds who are the secret of living. Whatever they sing is better than to know. And if men should not hear them, men are old. May my mind stroll about, hungry and fearless, thirsty and supple. And even if it's Sunday, may I be wrong. For whenever men are right, they are not young. And may myself do nothing usefully, and love yourself so more than truly. There's never been quite such a fool who could fail, pulling all the sky over him with one smile. There's never been quite such a fool who could fail, pulling all the sky over him with one smile. <laughs> It's beautiful that, and I don't pr profess to understand it all or to make sense of it all, but through it weaves a playfulness, a humour, and uh, a childish, childish sense of wonder. But he touches on, yes, the fool. Uh, again, harking back to my school days, I've changed the words slightly because it wasn't quite so peace, it didn't, didn't seem to matter in those days, it would now. Uh, so I've changed the words, it's much more acceptable. See the happy fool now. He doesn't give a damn. I wish I were a fool now. My God, perhaps I am. And there's a wonder, there's humour in that, but it's also wisdom. Um, how would we know if we're fools or not? Paul McCartney expressed it beautifully. Um... But the fool on the hill sees the sun going down and the eyes in his head see the world spinning round. I could sing the whole thing, but I will spare you that because it's either too cringeworthy or it has the potential to make you laugh. Um, but the point is, the fool on the hill sees the world, yes, sees the sun going down and the eyes in his head see the world spinning round. There are aspects to the fool that embody wisdom, just as there are aspects, yeah. Wisdom, wise, the wise fool, we'll come to that as well later with some of the tales from a particular culture. 
So um, who's to say what's foolish and what's wise and also what's funny and what's not? Let's have a song <laughs> from my from years ago, not particularly from my childhood, although I wish I, I wish I had known this when I was a child. Uh, this is this is just uh, this is not to sing along with unless you want one to actually why not it's from it's from Win uh, Winnie the Pooh Ray right? Amy on halfway up the stairs is the stair where I sit there isn't any other stair quite like it it's not at the bottom it's not at the top but this is the stair where I always stop. Halfway up the stair is a stair where I stop, stop. There isn't any other place quite like it. It's not at the bottom, it's not at the top, but this is the place where I always stop. There's a childishness in that, there's a humour, a very subtle, gentle humour. There's a wisdom in it as well. Um, A.A. Milne, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and also, just in the moment, there's something about being prepared to be a fool or to act the fool or to at least not worry about being laughed at if you want to laugh with. Um, maybe you're laughing at or maybe you're laughing with. I don't actually mind. <laughs> Laughter's medicine. <laughs> right. Moving on. So I'm going to talk about different types of laughter. Now one of the interesting things amongst many that I found, and I, I must profess, confess, profess, that I, I had a lot of laughs put into this together, but actually it's not something that can be conjured up as, at will. I may laugh occasionally during this, I hope I do, but I can't guarantee that. It's something that is spontaneous and can't, well, I say can't be forced, but it is contagious if you're with others who are laughing. Again, we'll talk more about that later. Herodotus in the, in the ancient Greek culture. I mean, I found this fascinating for as much what it didn't say as what it did say. Just briefly, he said he, he, he classed three, three types of laughter in his case, but three types of humour. He said, um, what did he say? He said, the first type of humour, those innocent or the, of wrongdoing, but ignorant, ignorant of their own vulnerability. I'll say that again. First type of humour. Those innocent of wrongdoing, but ignorant of their own vulnerability. He's talking actually about laughter, but don't worry about getting your head around that. It's not, it's not overly funny. The second one, second sort of laughter for him was mad. <laughs> mad. And the third one was overconfident. And what, it, it, it doesn't seem to me that he had a very healthy relationship to humour. Because there was nothing in there to suggest he's got a sparkle of it in his bones at all. Suggests he had no, no sense of what true humour <laughs> is. Anyway, that's, that's a view on the Greek. Now there's an, uh, another threesome, three qualities from the East, and then I'll come to, the, to us now, the West. These three, like I found sort of referred to in, in Eastern culture, the first one is Rajastic, which is described as being divine, benignly, to, to benignly describe the human condition, majestic. But I think it's, it, that is humour that, that is for good, for, to, to, uh, for common good. Majestic, I tend to equate uh, in my simple way, fantastic. Then there's tamasic humour. And tamasic humour is Nasty humour. Uh, tamasic sounds a bit like put vinegar to me, balsamic, tamasic, vinegar. So it's that sort of humour. And the third one they have is satvic, which is divine humour. Um, kind of soothsaying humour, uh, illuminatory humour. So rajastic, tamasic, satvic. Good humour, common humour, toxic, uh, sort of, yes, vinegar humour and soothsayer humour. So I wanted to, I thought about it, and I've come up with three categories. There may well exist, I'm sure this will exist somewhere in our pantheon of knowledge, but I came up with um, three categories of humour which we want to explore. The first one I've called true humour, 
So what does true humour, true humour do? I mean, humour can range from being for the benefit of one and all to causing grief for one and all. We know that. So this is the humour that lifts and inspires. Um, it gives us in, it gives us insight, but it, it's 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 simple. It can be, it's joyous. It's a medicine. It's a comment on our situation. It may involve satire, which we'll come on to. Um, and it can even in involve black humour. Um, but it's good, it's for the common good. It's not designed. I think this is the interesting thing for me. It comes back, this links to spiritual practice. If it's of good intent, of it, of, if it's of heartful, soulful intent, then it's, it's for the common good. But of course, there's the, it's opposite. It's toxic humour which is not for the common good at all. It can be very hurtful, harming, damaging. We know it. It can happen in playgrounds quite a bit. Um, it can happen in life. Um, sarcasm is often toxic. It doesn't have to be, but it generally is, I think. The interesting thing for me about sarcasm, it comes from the, the Greek, what is it? It comes from the Greek sarcasmos, <laughs> which is to tear or to rip, to tear flesh, to sneer, or to bite one's lip in a sort of, in a not very pleasant way. So that's sarcasm. And toxic humour has, I'm not going to dwell, I'm not going to, we'll, we'll have a few examples of each, but more of the, the, the joyous humour, I hope. Um, and then there's the third type of humour, which I've called divine humour, uh, inspires, teaches, life lessons, and it, it makes us smile or laugh. And the best humour, I think, in, often is the be, is, embodies all of those. The, the wisdom with uh, laughter, with, uh, in, uh, with insight and joy. So. Yes, I think my, yeah. To, to, to give people joy, to, without demeaning people, to give them joy, to lift them rather than demean or diminish. No need to hurt. Passionate, insightful, healing. So here's a few. I, see what takes your fancy out of this. Let's see if, see if we can categorise some of these according to that, that little template. I prefer to be a pessimist. It makes it easier to deal with my inevitable failure. I prefer to be a pessimist. It makes it easier to deal with my inevitable failure. Now, I'm not saying I believe that necessarily to be true, but it's a kind of black humour or a sort of... Uh, but with a, a hint of, uh, of, of, of something funny in there. Um, actually, I'd rather go for these. Hang on. Why should you never date a pen tennis player? Because love means nothing to them. What do you categorise that as? <laughs> I mean, these are some simple baby ones, but I, I just want to get in the mould of, you know, just remind us. And some of these you'll say, oh my God, no. And that's all right too. Some of these are cringeworthy. What, like this one. What happened when the strawberry crossed the road? There was a traffic jam. The first rule of Alzheimer's Club, don't mention chess club. What did the pirate say when he turned 80? I'm 80, I'm 80. <laughs> Why do cows wear bells? <laughs> because their horns don't work. Here's an interesting one. What's the difference between a well-dressed man on a bike and a poorly dressed man on a unicycle? Attire. <laughs> or I entered ten ponds in a pun con in a pun contest, hoping one would win. But no pun intended. <laughs> you can never lose a homing pigeon. If your homing pigeon doesn't come back, what you've lost is a pigeon. Okay. <laughs> no. I'm not proclaiming to, by any means, to be a comedian. In fact, what's interesting 
I didn't mention it in relation to Fool on the Hill. Comedians often embody a great deal of sadness. They're very much in touch with their, um, their opposite side, their depressive, sad side. And the best clowns, the best comedians, Tony Hancock, and many more, I'm sure you can think of some, they're, they're very uh, sad people, but yet they have the ability to make us laugh. Probably because they are so sad, they can go the other way. Here's, a, here's some example of this cutting humour. This was Golda Meir to a, a world leader. I don't know which one. She said, don't be so humble. You're not that great. <laughs> it's both funny, cutting and, and insightful at the same time. Always remember you're unique, just like everybody else. I like this one from Oscar Wilde. Some people cause happiness wherever they go. Others, whenever they go. So what we see is this ability of, for humour to uh, illuminate and to instruct and to make us smile. You'll never be as lazy as the person who named the fireplace. Finally, my winter fat is done. Now I'm on to spring rolls. The only normal people are the ones you don't know. <laughs> um, or you don't know very well. Okay, enough. That's the other thing with humour. You can have too much. And I, I don't... Yeah, I, I, humour, I wouldn't say it's my strongest card as you're, as you're, as you're learning. But within humour, and where I, I hope I can bring some insight, is, is in its ability, its, its ability to teach and its ability to heal and lift. And we do need it at this time. And hopefully one of those jokes brought a smile to your face. I dare say one, of, one or two of them may have done the opposite. <laughs> here's, here's one. This is, this is like wise teaching, but also it, it's quite funny. Millions long for immortality who don't know what to do with themselves on a Sunday afternoon. A couple of examples of black humour, if you'll bear with me. We'll get, we, we will move on to something else, but Oscar Wilde. The suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Or Fred Allen. I like long walks, especially when they are taken by people who annoy me. So these are funny but cutting and, and also insightful. And a couple more, two more, and then I, I'll, I'll desist, I'll give you a break. But this one from Einstein, I think it's, it's, it embodies all of them. It's funny, it's very wise, it's also quite cutting. The difference between stupidity and genius is that genius has its limits. <laughs> he put it another way. Two things are infinite in the universe. Oh, two things are, are infinite, the universe and stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. Two things are infinite, the, the universe and stupidity, and I'm not sure about the, the universe. Very wise man. Or self-deprecating, I walk around like everything is fine, but deep down inside my shoe, my sock is sliding off. That's quite a comment on life, but it, it's like sad humour, but there's something very, maybe there's something very English. I'm, I'm curious, those who are watching from abroad, does any of this make the faintest sense, or is it just another Englishman going off on one in a Monty Python-esque fashion? <laughs> Here's one for anyone in Scotland. I don't know if John and Lynn are watching, or Liz Harris. The Scottish Blessing. <laughs> which is probably in the, the, the sort of cutting category. Well, it is definitely in the cutting category. It's in that, ta what was the word, talsemic? Uh, I can't remember. Um, 
May those who love us, love us. And, may that, and those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. So may those who love us, love us. And those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that we may better know them by their limping. Now, you might find that a bit of a stretch. To, it, it, certainly, it, it's black humour. There's a smile in there as well as an, oh dear. And uh, it is quite toxic, but uh, fascinating. So I want to just touch on some Mullah Nasruddin for wisdom. We come to divine stories. And there was some of that in the Einstein there. Um, there's some of that in Oscar Wilde and Mark Twain, in my experience. And anyway, his... Mullah Nasruddin was a Sufi prophet who lived 1208 to 1285, somewhere around that time. Around the time Rumi and Hafiz were around, there was a great explosion of um, wise humour, because Rumi is humorous and so is Hafiz. And Mullah Nasruddin, wrote, he was regarded as a wise fool. He taught, he taught through telling various stories, which were often self-deprecating and and also um, kind of paradoxical. They had a twist usually. So he tells, I'll give you an example or two. He tells the story, Mullah Nasruddin, of, and the story's about himself, so he doesn't mind showing himself up, as it were. He tells the story where Mullah Nasruddin is looking for a key outside of the house, and he's lost the key to his house. And the neighbours all come round and they're helping him look for the key and no one can find the key. And then one of them thinks to ask, where did you lose it? And Mullah Nasruddin replies, I lost it in the house. And so why aren't you looking in the house? And Mullah Nasruddin says, because it's lighter out here. And so these are spiritual stories and divine wisdom. Why look for, yeah, where do you look for your spiritual source? Elsewhere or in the house? Another one of his... Um, he's invited to a, a, a slap-up meal, dignitaries, the, the, whole, the whole area has come to uh, hear him talk as a venerated and esteemed no, um, teacher. And he goes along in the evening and he, he hasn't got time to change. He's been working, helping a friend out in the fields. So he, he thinks, well... I haven't got time to change, I don't want to be late. So he turns up at the door of the establishment where they're having the meal. And of course, the, the, um, whoever's on, on the door looks, takes one look at him and thinks, not on, your, not on your Nelly, you're not coming in here. And he says, I'm the main speaker. No, you're not. He laughs at him. So Mullah Nasruddin thinks, and he goes, he thinks, I've got a friend round the corner I lent a, a lovely jacket to a couple of years ago, I wonder if he's still got it. And he pops around, gets this beautiful jacket and puts it on. And he looks very regal. And he goes back and of course they let him in. And he sits at the head of the table and they're all waiting for his words of wisdom. And uh, he sits there for a while. And then they dish up the first course, which is a bowl of soup. And he stands up and addresses them. And he tips the bowl of soup over his front, over his jacket. And he says to them, he says, Dear Jacket, I hope you enjoy this soup as it was clearly intended for you and not for me. Um, again, wisdom and illustration of something in that. And one final one, because I like working in threes. There's one about other oh, donkey story, yes. Mullah Nasruddin, there's a tale of him smuggling between countries let's assume it's between i don't know some middle eastern countries you might imagine up in the khyber pass between pakistan and afghanistan something like that he comes across with his donkey every day and saddle bags and loaded up and the customs examine it carefully and on he goes but the customs people over the years have realized he's a notorious smuggler it's known in the region that mullah nasruddin is the is the uh, smuggler extraordinaire and they they search the donkey and him meticulously but can never find anything 
And the, the customs post guard gets really frustrated, but he never found anything over several years. And then he retires, and in old age they compare notes, and the customs officer says, I know you were smuggling something, what was it? And Mullah Nasruddin turns to him and says, donkeys. So, wisdom tales, all sorts of different tales. Let's have a song just to honour that. So that was the wisdom of threes. So there's, there's a song, Three Drops Fire In My Head, which I owe to uh, Nimue Brown, who lives locally. Nimue, I hope you're well. I know you haven't been, but I hope you're better. Uh, honor of, so we'll honour Nimue in singing this, but we honour, yeah, the threes. It, the, the actual words go, three drops, fire in my head, three drops of inspiration. And uh, the words, I've changed the words slightly, but uh, if you care to uh, pick them up and join in, or at least with the chorus. Three drops, fire on, smile on my face. Three drops. Smile on my face, three drops. Smile on my face, three drops of inspiration. Looking in the mirror, smile on my face. Looking in the mirror, smile on my face. Looking in the mirror, smile on my face, three drops of inspiration. Playing with the children, smile on my face. Playing with the children, smile on my face. Playing with the children, smile on my face. Three drops of inspiration. Laughing out loud, smile on my face. Oh, oh. laughing out loud, smile on my face. Laughing out loud, smile on my face. Three drops of inspiration. Three drops, smile on my face. Three drops, smile on my face. Three drops, smile on my face. Three drops of inspiration. I don't know if you can hear it, but I think I've got the door or the table resonating with the drum when I play it. Anyway, or laughing, possibly. Okay. So, I want to move on to laughter. Now, laughter. Okay, a couple of... Started with a couple of proverbs and sayings. Here's um, a Tibetan proverb. The secret to living well and longer is eat half, walk double, laugh treble, and love without measure. I love that one. Secret to living well and long. Eat half, walk double, laugh treble, and love without measure. And there's a Yiddish proverb that I love as well. What soap is to the body, laughter is to the soul. Isn't that beautiful? What soap is to the body, laughter is to the soul. So I want to give you I found that this is a definition of laughter I came across in a in a serious uh, yeah, in, in a dictionary, but I found it funny. I wonder if you will. Laughter is a physical reaction in humans. Laughter is a physical reaction in humans, consisting usually of rhythmical, often audible contractions of the diaphragm and other parts of the respiratory system, resulting most commonly in forms of he he he, or ha ha ha. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's the definition of laughter, resulting most commonly in forms of he he he, or ha ha ha. <laughs> he, he, he. The thing is, it all, I read also, you can't laugh he ho ho, or ho ha, ho ha ho ha. It's got to be he he he, or ha ha ha. <laughs> Excuse me. Laughing is contagious. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a laughter yoga session. 
you might not feel like laughing when you go there, I didn't, but it's very difficult not to laugh when everyone else is laughing. It is contagious. There's a poem I'll read at the end from Spike Milligan that Fleur kindly pointed out that sums that up. Um, <laughs> there's a, there are many songs that you could say are humorous, but uh, there's, there's one in particular, The Laughing Policeman, that I knew, that I heard as a child. And Do you know it was, it was performed and presented first in 1921? And the guy who originally sang it was Charles Jolly, would you believe? <laughs> Charles Jolly. Um, go on, I'll tr I, you, you, you can turn off for a minute. You'll either laugh or cry at this. He laughs upon point duty, he laughs upon his beat. He laughs at everybody when he's walking down the street. He never can stop laughing, he says he never tried. But once he did arrest a man and laughed until he cried. <laughs> now I didn't get into laughter that time. And as I said earlier, you can't spontaneously necessarily make it happen. But I recommend if you ever if you're feeling low, go and listen to the laughing policeman. It's ridiculously, hilariously laughterful. <laughs> I'm laughing more at, <laughs> at myself than at the song at this moment. Uh, oh. Did you know that the study of laughter and humour is called gelatology? It sounds more like the study of some kitchen. Uh, <laughs> gelatology is the study of laughter and humour. Um, oh yeah. A smile is an inexpensive way to improve your looks. A smile is an inexpensive way to improve your looks. Oh, here's one I love. You see what? This is really interesting now. Some, I've got a few interesting things before we wind up. It's, um, laughter's reckoned to be primitive and instinctive, and indeed our ancestors, yeah, laughter will have been part of our ancestors' orbit, part of their pantheon of tools for coping and surviving in life. And indeed it's found in gorillas and primates, um, other chimpanzees. They laugh too. Laughter is not just for fun, it can be embarrassment or it can be social social norms, so, but it's primitive and it, it, it's embodied and in us, it's, it's, it's in our genes. There's a, there's a case of a couple of girls called the Giggle Twins. I kid you not, this is, they was, there was a study for 43, these girls, poor, poor girls, they were split up at birth, now, whether their parents died or whatever. They were split at birth and given to different families, the Giggle Twins. For 43 years they never saw each other. When they came together, they compared stories and they just laughed their socks off all the time. And they had the same humour as each other. And what's even more interesting, they were both in very dour, sober, humourless families. So they, they were brought up in sterile humour. But they both couldn't help laugh at everything. And when they came together, they were, that's just them, the Giggle Twins. I love that story. I've talked how, it, how laughing re relaxes the, uh, dilates the blood vessels. But it also, it, it, it boosts the immune system. It, it enhances the capacity, the capacity of the T cells to perform. They've done studies. So in this time, our immune systems can be boosted by laughter. Um, so why wouldn't we? Um, now, there's, some, there's a couple of tales of laughter that are so, so tragic, they're funny. That's the other thing. Shakespeare was a brilliant alchemist, wasn't he, of the comic tragedy or the tragic comic. Get this. Um, in 1410, the King of Aragon, King Martin... He, he had a he had a particularly uh, a particularly effective court jester. His court jester was renowned for his capacity to tell jokes and make people laugh. 
So King Martin, of course, being the king, he had the best jester in the land. And uh, one day the court jester told this joke that was so funny that King Martin laughed until he died. <laughs> I mean, the joke was that good. But he's not alone. Uh, on the 24th of March, 1975, a guy called Alex Mitchell was watching an episode of The Goodies uh, called Kung Fu Capers. It was called Kung Fu Capers. And in it, there's the Scotsman wielding his bagpipes. And he's in, he's in combat uh, with a Yorkshireman. Well, no, it was not a Yorkshireman. With a master of the Lancastrian martial art of Eckythump wielding a black pudding. And this guy, Alex Mitchell, he found it so funny that after laughing for 25 minutes, he had a heart attack and died. Now, why it's known about his wife is that his wife, she was obviously grief stricken, but she also said, thank you, goodies, for sending him off in such a beautiful way. The last example of this sort of thing, and perhaps the most extreme, and, and certainly it's funny and it's tragic. In 5th century before BCE, so several thousand years ago, there was a Greek painter called Zixus, or Zixus. Xerxes, Xerxes. He was renowned as a portrait painter. As, a, as actually, he he specialised in painting models, new models, and he developed that. But he died. He died laughing at the humorous way that he painted Aphrodite. He, he his last commission was to paint Aphrodite, the goddess of love. But what tickled him so much was he he, he did paint her, but his patroness insisted on being the model, and she was okay. <laughs> she, she was ancient and not very, and, and he found it very funny. Whatever it was, it tickled him to death. We say tickled to death, don't we? There was another one, I, I won't go into the detail of it. Another, another one, he died when his donkey ate some figs and they poured wine into it. They added wine, and the, again, this guy, he was a philosopher and died. But here's the essence. True humour is fun. True humour is fun. It does not put down kid or mock. It makes people feel wonderful. Not separate. Not different. Not cut off. True humour has beneath it the understanding that we're all in this together. And I hope some of, the, some of those... Uh, various jokes have, have, have illustrated that. Why did the chicken commit suicide? To get to the other side. What's the difference between England and a tea bag? The tea bag stays in the cup longer. So that's a particular, yeah, you, you probably need to be at least British to get that. But um, what's lovely about that, tea and football, English preoccupations are coupled with self-deprecation. The tea bag stays in the cup longer. Yes, indeed it does. Oh, this one. I like this. A man walks into a bar with a roll of tarmac under his arm. And he says, I'll have a pint, please. And a pint for the road. I went to the doctor the other day and, he, and, and I said, uh, have you got anything for wind? And he gave me a kite. Or oh, one of my old favourites. <laughs> this may be lost on some of you. And it, 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 it's a reflection of my sort of humour, which I, I confess is <laughs> slightly unique. Anyway, did you hear about the dyslexic, agnostic, insomniac? the dyslexic agnostic insomniac who lay awake all night wondering oh is there really a dog <laughs> anyway en enough enough I'll spare you I want to finish <laughs> I want to finish with this from Spike Milligan I, can't, I wish I could remember it but I'll read it smiling is infectious you catch it like the flu when sm someone smiled at me today, I started smiling too. 
I walked around the corner and someone saw me grin. And when he smiled, I realised I'd passed it on to him. I thought about the smile and then realised its worth. A single smile like mine could travel round the earth. So if you feel a smile begin, don't leave it undetected. Start an epidemic and get the world infected. And how much, how more beautiful to get the world infected with smiles and laughter and humour than what's currently going on at all sorts of levels. So just to wrap that up, humour. Yes, I've taken you on a wild, wonderful, wacky and convoluted route to trying to illustrate the value of humour on the spiritual path, but on the secular path in life um, for fun, simple, playful, always look to the children. I'll just finish with a song. Well, I mended the words again. I just want to check what I wrote instead. Oh, musician of my soul, smile your song, smile your song with every breath. Oh, musician of my soul, Smile your song, smile your song with every breath. O oh, musician of my soul, smile your song, laugh your song with every breath. Don't be afraid to look silly, we all are, <laughs> whether we realise it or not. I hope you've gained a little something from this journey, this night. I hope one or two of the forays into humour made you smile or laugh. There are several more here, but I'm going to spare you. Be grateful. Anyway, lots of, <laughs> lots of love. Earth service next fr on Friday. It'll be very near to Imolk. We'll celebrate Bridget. We'll celebrate the emergence of spring. And as ever, honour the earth and each other in community. For those that have uh, stood the course, survived the, the caper um, and the canter and the, the journey, thank you. Lots of love, lots of beauty. Beauty be with you. And lots of smiles, lots of humour. I'll blow the candle out for all of your well-being and smiles and love and laughter be yours.